how do you actually nurture network effects? So right. what are some of the important metrics that you encourage people to look at? Yeah, so we wrote an entire blog post that's filled with 16 oh, metrics. Of course, 16. <laughs> of course 16. Obviously, there's only 16. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, exactly. So going back to the point about network effects, one of the primary misconceptions about network effects being that they're binary, either you have them or not. We think that they're a lot more nuanced and they can grow and, and decline over time. And so we wrote up this whole list of 16 different ways to measure network effects. Um, and these are some of the internal metrics that we use when we're evaluating companies or doing diligence. And when we ask ourselves, like, yeah. are there network effects present for this particular startup? And the way I like to think about these metrics is like you can look at sort of leading indicators of network effects, and then there's a whole grouping of metrics that are more lagging indicators of network effects. And when people talk about network effects and measuring them, they typically talk about the lagging indicators, actually. So they talk about things like dow to mal ratio. Like, mm -hmm. is that over 40 or 50 percent? Like, if it is, then it probably has network effects because there's really high engagement. Or they'll talk about things like pricing power. Um, mm -hmm. If your company has really high gross margins and can easily raise prices, then it probably has network effects because it has that pricing power. I think on a micro level, it's much more valuable to actually look at the leading indicators of network effects um, because it allows you to really understand the nuances of what's happening inside your product. So examples of leading indicators of network effects would be things like retention cohorts and retention curves. Mm -hmm. So looking at all of the cohorts of your product, um, users who started in a given month, ideally you would see with network effects that the users who joined in more recent cohorts, who joined when the network was more developed and there are more users, they should be sticking around more. They should have mm -hmm. higher retention than the earlier cohorts. Yeah. Um, so you'll see this with the curve, the decay curves, right? The most recent cohorts should be at the top, right? Exactly. They've decayed the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A complicating factor, though, that we've seen for that particular metric is that there's the early adopter effect mm -hmm. in place, which often means that the earlier cohorts are actually better retained because the earlier adopters tend to be the ones that are you know, more loyal and committed and more perfect matches for your product. Right. The so wild enthusiasts found their way to your product early. You didn't have to advertise to get them. Yeah, right? exactly. Now, on the other hand, you're hoping to see the more recent cohorts decay less because your product is improving, mm -hmm. right? So there's sort of a tension there. Right? Yeah, there yeah. is a tension there. And then um, another cool metric that I I really love seeing among startups is the power user curve. Mm -hmm. This is another blog post that's on our website. Um, but basically, it involves plotting out the histogram of all of your monthly active users for a given month and seeing like how many days of the month they were active in your product mm -hmm. from one day a month all the way through to 30 out of 30 days. Mm -hmm. And so with a network effect product, you would expect that as your network grows and as time elapses, the more recent MAUs, like if you were to plot this histogram for a recent month, that their power user curve would be more right-leaning, like more users are coming back 30 out of 30 days, mm -hmm. versus the earlier cohorts, which might be more left-leaning. So the shape of the curve that you're looking for is a smile. Exactly. Right? Which is, boy, there's a lot of addiction on the high end, right? right. Like they're there every day or every hour or whatever it is. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think like at a high level when you're thinking of it, like, like I, I think the 60 metrics are really good if you're kind of a, a founder thinking about like how do I measure my specific network effects. I think like at the macro level, the way to think about network, like the strength of a network is to say like how much, how much like energy would somebody else need in order to build a good enough replica of mm -hmm. my network, mm -hmm. right? And so like, Gener it's not always capital, but you can kind of like say like if it's an amazing team, you know, working on this idea, like how much capital would they need in order to stand up a good enough network? And if your answer is like, wow, they're going to need like billions of dollars, that means you have a strong network. Mm -hmm. If it's like, oh, they're going to need like, you know, fifty dollars, that means you have a weak network, right? right? So if you think about like, if I wanted to recreate YouTube, like it's going to take me like hundreds of millions of dollars at the very least yeah, to very like least. recreate that library and go and find all those those people to recreate those videos. If you think about like, I want to create a ride sharing platform in Toronto, 
that's probably going to be a lot less. If you're thinking like, I want to create a restaurant delivery platform in one part of a city, that's going to be even less. So I think that, you know, that's kind of like the macro idea for how you can think about your network effect. Right. The cost of recreating. Exactly. Right? Sort of the bottom yeah. line there. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Gives you a sense of the strength of the network. Yeah. Good. Other measurements that you think uh, entrepreneurs ought to be paying attention to? Um, so another class of metrics that we talk about is uh, related to competitors and multi-tenanting. Um, so in network effects land, you often see that users are not just using your particular product, but they're also participating in other networks that have a similar value proposition. So for instance, we all know that there's a ton of different ride sharing apps out there. And maybe when all of these networks are just getting started, users aren't loyal to any given one because they're all sort of spotty in their quality. You, you're not sure about the ETA for any of them. And so each time you need a ride, you open up you know, three different apps to check the ETAs among all of them. Okay. But suppose that the network effects for Lyft are getting stronger over time. So over time, you'd expect multi-tenanting to go down. You'd expect to see users becoming more loyal to that one app over time. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and, and I think, I mean, at the end of the day, what you're really looking for, and I think this is like the kind of lagging indicators that you were talking about, is the idea of pricing power. Like, if I'm a platform that can take a 15% take rate, and there's another platform that comes in with a 10% take rate, and my platform is still more valuable, and people still want to use my platform, like, that's ultimately, at the end of the day, all of these kind of metrics are going to bubble up into that once your network hits scale. Yeah. Pricing power is sort of the ultimate metric, right? right. It's lagging, but it's right. the exactly. perfect demonstration of power. Yeah. And right. you, you invest a lot in the front end to build the network and to get to that point. But like at the end of the day, it's like all of that stuff adds up to kind of pricing power at the end. Yeah. 